Hello, welcome everybody to our latest edition of AJOT Authors and Issues. On Authors and Issues, we like to talk to authors about their research and other things to help bridge the gap between research and practice. My name is Stacy Reynolds. I am the editor in chief of AJOT. And joining us today is Isaiah Wills, the AJOT student representative. Today is Dr. Christy Patton. Uh, she is Vice Dean of Academic Affairs and Professor of Occupational Therapy at New York University. And Dr. Patton was the 2022 Eleanor Clark Slagle Lectureship Award recipient. Her talk delivered at the 2022 AOTA conference was entitled Finding Our Strengths, Recognizing Professional Bias and Interrogating Systems. Uh, the full transcript of her lecture is published in the most recent issue of AJOT, volume 76.6. So welcome, Christy. We are really excited to have you here today. Yay. I'm really Yay. excited to talk to you. Um, can you just start us off? Tell us where you are Zooming in from. Sure. Well, thanks, uh, Stacey. And thanks, Isaiah. It's great to be here in conversation with you about this topic. Um, I am Zooming in from a very foggy New York City. <laughs> I'm at NYU in my office, and we have actually a severe fog warning today, so it's a very foggy day in, in the city. Um, yeah, that's where I'm coming from, and I am Vice Dean of Academic Affairs, like you said, so I'm already, you're, I think, my third meeting. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah, I, I think I said to you once, I needed to take you out for a cup of coffee or something to find out what life as a chair and then a dean is like, because it just seems crazy to me that you have all these administrative, or have had all these administrative roles, but conversation for another day I think it might require wine and not coffee <laughs> I I like the way you think okay Isaiah you want to jump in I think you had our first question today yeah sure well hi hey, good morning um yeah thanks for meeting with morning. us um, um so I guess my first question jump in right, jump right in right away is um as a student um I'd never um, heard of the Sligo award until I um got to attend the AOTA conference last year. Um, and for, for people who haven't um, heard of a Sligo lecture or um, heard of the award, um, can you tell them a little bit a little bit more about what it is um, and how you're selected? Sure, sure. Well, Isaiah, I'm glad. I'm glad I was your first Slagle <laughs> for, for your for your rookie. So hopefully it was meaningful. Um, uh, it's it's given to a OT or an OTA um, that is recognized for uh, substantial and lasting work, creative contributions um, to the development of the body of knowledge of the profession. So it's a little um, intimidating when you think about how that's described. Um, but it's, and who's won it in the past, but I, you're given it, um, actually I was notified by the president of AOTA at the time, Wendy Hillebrand, in the fall of 2020. So if you remember the fall of 2020, it was a rather dark time. Uh, we were full pandemic mode. We were, uh, so it was a, it was a lovely award um, to be notified of, and then to be excited about something in a time that we, there wasn't too much to be excited about. And, and then you're awarded it in the spring of 2021. So I was given it in the spring of 20, my name was announced. And then you're given a year to write um, and you're given a year before you have to give it. So um, it was incredible. It was, so that's, uh, it's a really, really was a very humbling honor. And I really cherish the time that I was given to put, um, my work into perspective, work of previous uh, therapists and researchers that I really admired and try to deliver a good, a good talk. And I'm gonna kind of build on that a little bit, Christy, is that your, your lecture really is a call to action for the OT community to examine our own biases and to kind of make this shift to a strengths-based model. And I'm curious what your process was in deciding what your topic was going to be for the lecture and maybe what previous Slagles had inspired you, or did you really think like, this is what a good Slagle needs to be, and I'm going to make sure I do these things? Mm. That's a great question, and I have a lot of parts of that answer. Um, the one thing I know is how I teach, right, and how I speak, and I, I knew that I wanted to do something that... Um, could, I'm so passionate about my work and what I what I do that I and the partnerships I have with autistic advocates and disability advocates 
And how could I do something that would be representative of that? And I know that I'm not the person that's going to talk about, for example, the autistic experience. That's not for me to do. You know, that's for us to collaborate and hire autistic researchers and educators to do. But I, I knew that I felt very strongly about shifting the mindset um, of professionals. So um, I began to just read and, and I knew my body of work, right? And kind of my ethos that I wanted to bring in at first. And I knew that I had like, if you could take away anything, I want you to take away this, right? And I had a couple things that I was thinking about. But then as I read, I really was struck by the work that had been done. Um, actually, previous Slagles, yes. Um, Ann Grady's Slagle about inclusion, because I do a lot around inclusion. That hit me. And, and I read that, which had she had referred to Mary Law's Muriel Driver lecture. So I went back to the, the Muriel Driver lecture, which is the, akin to this the similar type of award in Canada that the Canadian OT Association um, awards. And I read Mary Law and she had written that right after Michael Oliver had started talking about the social model of disability. And I knew the social model of disability was part of what where I wanted to go as well. So I went back to these origins and I was struck by how quickly OTs jumped on that bandwagon of social model of disability and started writing about it and started really questioning. But then as I read more and more, you, you, you saw that thread throughout, but it kept getting drowned out by a larger kind of medical model chorus in our profession. And then the 2005 uh, AJOT issue that uh, Dr. Gary Kilhoffner was the guest editor of was all about disability studies and really this, again, this call to action. And because I was chasing this thread and like pulling this thread and saying, okay, where did we go after that as a profession? And there were pieces and, you know, there's the Occupational Therapy and Disability Studies Network. And then in, uh, I believe summer 2021, um, AJOT published a, another special issue about disability studies, um, which I read. and. And I'm reading this all in the background of the work that I've done with self-advocates and kind of the messages that I want to get across. But in that, in that, um, in that special issue of AJOT, it was so interesting to see how they went back and interviewed 11 of the 13 authors. So I thought, wow, this is them pulling them up and saying, okay, authors in 2005, how are we doing in 2021? And I was struck by um, something that Mary Law had said. Ann Grady had said, Gary Kielhoffner had said, and now the authors reflecting back on their work in 2005 were st saying in 2021. And some of the things that, that, that was so consistent that I thought, well, how, how, how well have we done this? Because I know my work in the area of stakeholder engagement, and it was really about center those marginalized voices, center those stakeholder voices in research, education, and practice. You know, and I know that that's something that I've been trying to do in every project of mine, every, uh, uh, you know, I have an NSF grant, we have autistic researchers on that grant. Um, I don't write anything usually without autistic uh, stakeholder involvement and engagement. Um, there are journals that require that stakeholder statement. There are grants that require stakeholder engagement. So the, the field, the larger field um, is moving towards the stakeholder engagement, but I was struck by how, um, we were still talking about needing the voice. So if you've listened to the lecture, you know that I have a lot of quotes by autistic uh, activists and disability activists. So that kind of was like, all right, they're telling me we've got to center the voice. We've got to make sure that this voice is central. So um, that's kind of, that was the, that's where everything started coming together. When I realized we're still talking about the same thing. We're still talking about who are you talking to? Are you sent? Are you partnering with disability communities? Are you centering um, the voice of those that we serve in education, research, and practice? And that really helped everything click in. But it was a long process, a fun process of reading and reading a lot of things that um, I don't usually read. So I can see why you get you needed a whole year. Why you get a whole year to do mm -hmm. that? Yeah, um, it's a, it was quite the process. Definitely. And I got a lot of advice too, where people said, don't write, just read first, which was a gift and very good advice. Because yeah. I think when we are given a task like this, we start putting our ideas on paper. And uh, I, did, I didn't do that. And um, kind of to build off of that, um, 
So in the, the beginning of the lecture, you talked about um, a strengths-based model versus a deficit approach, and that's typically used um, in healthcare today. Um, for, for those that are not feel familiar with a strengths-based model, could you um, explain its importance and uh, maybe provide an example of how a strengths-based model can benefit our clients? Sure, sure. So uh, I first want to say a strength-based model is not ignoring challenges. You know, I think that's when you hear about that or when uh, the initial reaction by therapist is, well, I have to work on deficits. Uh, you know, that's what I'm paid for. That's, that's what insurance covers. I have to work on deficits. That what, that's what we assess. Um, and uh, my response back to that is, yes, you do. And what about the rest of the story? You have you, Isaiah, you, Stacy, you are not building your lives on remediated weaknesses. So if we're if we're serving our clients well and helping them reconstruct or construct a meaningful life with meaningful occupations, why would it just focus on weaknesses? You know, um, if, if we have a K through 12 system that for in special education that says, all right, you have an IEP now. What we're going to do every day is we're going to work on the things that are challenging for you in order for you to get better. And we know how to do that as the professionals. And we do that K through 12. We have some successes. We may not have some successes. We discharge kids from OT um, because they're getting bored with therapy in middle school or whatever, you know, but we have this and, and, and we wonder why kids aren't doing better after high school. Well, we did a lot of focus groups in this one research project that we did, and kids can't even identify what they're good at because the system has worked. From K through 12, we've said, okay, you're not good at this, we'll work on this. And then we talk to your parents about what you're not good at, so we need to work on this. Imagine your life if every day at VCU, you're a student at VCU, right, Isaiah? Every day you come in and you say, we're going to do something that you're not good at, that you may not be interested in, and we're going to do it every day. And then we're gonna do it again tomorrow. And then we're gonna give you check marks and see how well you did. And if you didn't do it well enough, no Penn State game for you. You know, like it, it, we, 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 we have this system in place around special needs and special education, K through 12. And we have a, a healthcare model that basically says, um, I know the interventions to fix your disability. We fix medical issues, that's the medical model. You know, uh, we, if you have a medical problem, I need fixed. I need, like I said, in my Slagle, I had a gallbladder, my gallbladder moved three weeks before I gave it. The medical model worked beautifully. If I have a lifelong disability, I have medical issues where I need the medical model, but I have so much more that I need from professionals than the, than the medical model offers. And the strength-based model really recognizes that and recognizes that it's not about fixing deficits. That's a piece of it. And, the, and really looking at what are the deficits and what are the barriers. But you know, it's also looking much more nuanced and more complicated at the evaluation process and saying, yes, I'll evaluate your challenges, but I really need to know your assets as well and your interest and your, you know, and uh, I am teaching a class on, sorry, I'm rambling. I'm teaching a class on disability justice and radical inclusion and, to undergrads here at NYU and uh, from all over the school. It's a, a great class. And I have about eight students that have identified as having a disability in the, that class. And the other day, the one student who was twice exceptional, meaning gifted and dis had a disability. And then I have another student that had a disability all through high school. And they describe the difference between their two meetings. And the gifted, the twice exceptional student went to her meeting and got to hear all about her strengths. And they said, don't worry about these weaknesses. The student that went to the regular IEP meeting got to hear all about her weaknesses and no, both of those are wrong, Yeah. right? Both of those are wrong and they don't address um, being grounded in this, in this strength-based model. So a strength-based model, for example, I'll give you a good example. Interest, kids that are autistic have interest and they have a lot of interest in, in trains, for example, in the subway system, New York City. Uh, my kids love the subway system. There's a lot of information to gather in the subway system. So a uh, deficit-based model looks at that as a restricted interest and says, okay, what we have to program to is getting rid of train talk, subway talk. And you're rewarded when you don't talk about the train or the subway because that's pathological and we need it to go away, okay? It's a deficit. 
A strength-based model will say, you love trains? Wonderful. Let's figure out how to infuse them in your learning. We know they're not they're not anxiety producing, they're not, uh, they're, they're calming. You can learn content. You can learn a ton of things if you talk about the New York City subway system. From spelling to history to art, there's so much to learn if I use it. Uh, and we did a study, we're working on it now for publication where we asked teachers, we asked teachers and therapists, about 90 teachers and therapists, and we gave them some scenarios about interest. And we said, okay, now how are you gonna use them? We had a, a scale and different kind of areas to use them in. And they said they would use these interests to address challenging behavior and to calm the student, that they were the most helpful in those two areas. They were the least helpful in learning academic content, personal development, and social connection because they did not know how to do that. A strength-based model says, no, don't use them when the problem's already there and you're using them as a reward to calm a child, embed them and you'll see such a difference. And that's what we do in all our programs. I'm PI of the ASD Nest Project. We're the largest inclusion program in the country that we operate from your interest or your interest. How can we develop them? How can we give you connection? Our NSF grant is about maker clubs where kids can come together around their interests. And how can we utilize those interests in a way that, guess what? You develop social skills when you're in an interest-based club versus a social skills club. Surprise. You go to a football game because you're interested in football game. You hike, Stacy, because you're interested in hiking and you make connections around those activities. You don't need to go to let me learn how to be social in order to hike. You hike in your social. And I think OTs have a real good lens on meaningful occupations where we can use these interests in a real strength-based way versus a deficit-based way. Amazing. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I think that really resonates with a lot of different people. And and then what I really what I liked about your talk and and I feel like if I was ever honored enough to give one of these one days, I, I would want to challenge people. And that's what you came out and did. And I think about Jim Hinojosa's Slagle and he went out and challenged people. You know what? I think he pissed people off a little bit. And I think that's okay because it's an opportunity to really make people think and reflect. And so what you asked people to do in listening to your Slagle or, or if they end up reading it for the first time in AJOT, you asked them to be willing to be wrong. And to say, you know, maybe we have done some things wrong in OT, and maybe we all individually have approached a case from the wrong lens, from the medical model lens, and tried to fix something, or tried to change a behavior, or, or whatever. And you, um, very eloquently in your in your speech, talked about being um, uh, willing to be ten percent mortified, ten percent more terrified, and ten percent more satisfied as a beginning step for positive change. And um, I'm wondering how you think people received that message. You know, mm. we were people ready for that change. Were they willing to be uncomfortable with the discomfort? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, lots of thoughts with that question. So I might ramble a little bit. <laughs> uh, I'm here uh, for it. Let's go. <laughs> so D Dolly Chug, my colleague at NYU um, Stern, wrote a brilliant book where that 10% mortifying, 10% terrifying, how good people fight bias. It was her book and I highly recommend it. Um, I love that you mentioned Jim Hinojosa pissing people off because Jim, rest in peace, it was yeah. so there as I was writing this Slagle. He uh, is someone that I, I, um, I don't know if you know this, but I was, I was at Temple University when NYU recruited me. I had accepted the job at NYU in the spring of the year he gave his lecture. Oh, okay. And I, uh, I went there as someone that had been doing a lot of work in sensory areas, um, mm -hmm. similar to your work, Stacey. And um, I was around several of my colleagues who were listening to that lecture and getting pissed off. And they said to me, they said to me, um, oh, we can't believe you're going there. I can't believe you're going there. You know? <laughs> so, so I said, no, this makes me really excited to go there. Like, I, everything I know about Jean Ayers, she would want people questioning. She would want, uh, you know, that scientific uh, method happening and saying, no, let's open it up. Maybe we're doing things that we shouldn't be doing, you know? So I was, I was actually really um, 
inspired inspired by by Jim as a, as I wrote this. Um, the whole I was wrong. I had given a TEDx talk a while ago where that was the title of it. Um, I was wrong, and it resonated with me that we are so um, we rarely do that as a society. Th think of any issue, you know, where we we say, oh, you know, I might be wrong in this. We kind of dig in and, you know, defend our position. We dig in our heels, as you said, and you're mm -hmm. like, no, no, this is the right way to do it. And I think um, uh, as a community, how it was received, I, I'll say that for the first people that came up to me afterwards and, or the first people that emailed me, I got a lot of emails about it, none negative, to yeah. be honest with you, but the first, and I knew I, the first people that came up to me were disabled OTs that said, thank you. Thank you. And I said, you guys should be up here talking, right? You know, and given this legal about your experience. But the fact that the disability community in OT came up and said, you said what needed to be said. Um, I felt very um, honored. And it, after that, it didn't matter how it hit, yeah. to be honest with you. Because I, 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 I knew that people were, would, are, are going to either say, hmm, let me think about it. Or that's ridiculous. I am a medical model therapist and she doesn't know what she's talking about, you know, whatever, you know, people are going to, that's what that Adam Grant quote that I put in, you get to decide what's meaningful in the lecture that I gave. Um, I gave it based on our history, my research and the disability voice. And, and to me, those are three elements that I wanted to bring to it. So, um, how, what you take. I haven't gotten any negative response. Um, uh, yeah, a couple of people came up to me. They said they, 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 they really loved and engaged, liked engaging too. When I made people commit to something, um, that call to action, I commit to, even though the slides got messed up, <laughs> um, because when you commit to an action to kind of view your, I basically was asking people to be 10% more terrified and 10% more or 10% more mortified, you know, and to um, be more than a ally. I think a lot of us are allies with uh, the disability community where we've read things, we support, we go to marches, we, um, but Bettina Love in the, in the black community has a wonderful um, small clip and she talks about the allies versus a co-conspirator. And, you know, an ally is someone who's read all the books, who's read all the books before you. And she has this wonderful description of it in her book. And, um, but a co-conspirator puts something on the line. A co-conspirator says, no, don't pay me, pay my autistic colleague who could do it better than me. You know, and a, a co-conspirator has something to lose. And I think that, you know, uh, in a, in a, in a way that moves something forward. And in my case, and what I was talking about was ableism. So are we calling it out? You know, are we calling it out? Are what are we doing when we see it in our own practices and businesses and medical communities? You know, there were, and the New York Times just um, came out with an article last week. I think one of my students sent it to me. Um, how uh, doctors prefer patients without disabilities? I saw that. Yeah. Right. Yep. So, so, so what does that mean for our profession? And are we calling that out? And are we, are we, and in the lecture, I said, you know, we have this narrative and I do think our bias is well-intentioned, uh, but our bias is overcoming disability. And that's how we're trained. Uh, I would love to see a shift our bias to overcoming ableism and what's our role there. You know, if healthcare professionals prefer non-disabled people, that's a big problem. And what does that mean? And how welcoming is the healthcare system to patients with disabilities and clients with disabilities if we prefer non-disabled individuals? It's terrifying. Yeah, oh. be 10% more terrified. Like, <laughs> ter terrified. Like that it should terrify us all that um, we prefer non-disabled individuals and this is our practice. So... Because and I, I do believe that's because we haven't confronted our own kind of ableism, and our own preference, you know, um, because we have a preference to fix and make the disability go away, right? And is that where we should be spending our time? Right, um, you know, and kind of building off of that as well, 
um, you know, you, you, we're talking about, um, you were talking about high and low functioning individuals um, as opposed to high and low functioning environments. Um, um, what do you feel um, still needs to be done to address um, the needs of our um, clients experiencing barriers due to um, preconceived notions of disability versus environments? Yeah, well, going back to calling it out, every time you hear that phrase as an OT, I would love to see the OT say, you know what, instead of talking about high and low functioning individuals, let's talk about the environment and what makes that individual function well. Or is this environment conducive to this individual functioning well? You know, you have an individual that's autistic, for example, and is easily overstimulated, just as a baseline, easily overstimulated by, by auditory, let's say. Um, that doesn't change. The individual doesn't change. The environment changes to support that individual, you know? And I think that, for example, when we look at, um, you know, and I think the models are getting better, Stacey, I don't know how you feel about this, but, you know, a lot of the models are still, let me take this individual, I'm a school system therapist, for example, let me take this individual down to my therapy room. Let me work on the sensory issues that 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 child has um, in isolation and let me take them back and ease them back into the classroom, right? Well, I know my work with autistic advocates, they see no point of that. <laughs> They're like, well, okay, that was fun. You know, that was fun. And they, they may have some, some, some benefit, but they are in environments that are changing all the time. So instead of that model, which might have a place in some sense, in some senses, but what if in, in addition to, or instead of, depending on the child and the child's needs, we taught that individual how to, A, do sensory scans in their environment to identify those barriers and the things that they find problematic, and B, develop sensory advocacy, which my colleague Stephen Shore calls the first step of self-advocacy is sensory advocacy, because kids really know very early on what their preferences, their likes and dislikes are from a sensory perspective. So how do I engage in like, how do I help that child do sensory advocacy that's listened to by adults in the room and respected by adults? You know, um, Stephen Shore, who's my colleague who's autistic, he wears, a, most of his pictures see him in a baseball hat. That's his advocacy. Because he knows there are gonna be some environments that they can't change the lighting. There are some, but there are many more that they can't. So baseball cap, you'll always see him in the baseball cap, right? Um, and he had to figure all these things out himself. He never had OT. And he, he and I have had conversations about this where it'd be great to have an OT problem solve those things. That's, very, that's a very different model than that individual factors. And let me, let me work on that low functioning individual, quote unquote, that can't... Um, that can't tolerate, you know, a, a overstimulating environment. And I, I, I also think that there is going back to the idea of bias. When we call someone low functioning or high functioning, our bias enters in right away. Because if I say low functioning individual, what do you think of? As a as a therapist or as a what do you think of? I mean, you're thinking low IQ, right? Or not? Right. Yeah. You immediately associate with low IQ. And if you think of high functioning individual, what do you associate that with? Superior abilities in an area. Superior abilities, right? So you've basically put, got two boxes now that doesn't serve either person well. It doesn't serve the high functioning individual that you've now put in the box of superior abilities who has maybe crippling anxiety in situations and cannot demonstrate those superior abilities and needs services and needs good, uh, good, good supports and services. But because they're high functioning with superior abilities, you say, no, they don't need us. You have the low functioning that you now have associated with low IQ that you then now program to a low IQ and not assume competence. So these boxes immediately, and we didn't even practice this, Stacey, and you gave the exact answers <laughs> that, that I, would, I would think most therapists would give and researchers and educators would give. And, that dichotomy not only doesn't serve either group well, it's dangerous. It's dangerous. It's dangerous in that you are missing a group that may need real supports in order to, to have a good quality of life and participate fully. And you're also underestimating a group 
that you're now relegating to a life of um, programming that never assumes their competence. Versus if I have that individual that's low functioning, which primarily in my field in autism, we mean non nonverbal and low IQ. Um, if I have that individual who now has access to a reliable, universally understood communication system, and I've worked with too many autistic individuals that type independently to communicate to say that it's a one-off or it's a miracle or it's an amazing thing. There's so many individuals out there that are non-speaking that once they find access to a reliable, universally understood communication system, demonstrate a full range of skills that becomes a higher functioning environment. The individual didn't change. You just, you change the environment for that individual to succeed. And goodness, if OTs can't make this shift from high and low functioning yeah. individuals to high and low functioning environments, I don't know what profession can. And I hope this is one of those areas where knowledge translation, because I feel like people like you are there, you know, like the research is starting to get there people are talking, people are publishing, but it's still not getting translated and embedded in the schools, in the clinics and places like that. And, and I know the most recent research is still like there's this 15 to 17 year gap between best practices being published and then being implemented. And I just don't think we can wait 15 to, you know, we've waited this long, like the the disability study section said, you know, from 2005 to 2021, and they're still talking about the same things. And so I really hope that your cycle was a push, you know, um, for people to start making the shift more quickly. You know, and, and I have heard from clinicians too, the, you know, that have really, they said, listen, I tried this and it worked. Like I tried, like, and I was like, great, keep doing more of it. And like, I never, you know, and it was about interest or um, some uh, clinician got in touch with me that they brought in a disability activist to have a lunch session with their therapist and it totally changed a couple of things that they're gonna do. I mean, that is such low hanging fruit, right? Talk to the disability community, partner with the disability community. And it's low hanging fruit and that all it requires is effort and uh, a sense of wanting to do that. Um, sponsor them, pay them to come guest lecture and it, it will change the way we do things. It, it just does. It just does. It, and because you are, you are inviting a partnership with someone that has a lived experience that you don't, that really um, from a disability studies and disability justice perspective knows exactly what they need and what they need from professionals. You know, that's why we have, they give out awards, the disability dongles, right? That are assistive tech gone wrong that no one with a disability uses. <laughs> <laughs> that was invented somewhere, but, you know, was a horrible idea, horrible idea, you know? So we did a hackathon at NYU one time and we had four exemplars, four individuals with disabilities, someone that was autistic, someone with, that was blind and low vision, someone that uh, was a wheelchair user and someone that um, uh, had uh, used uh, crutches um, and had weakness on one side of her body. And they, the hackers came in, they're like, here's what we need. Try to design this. And they came up with some brilliant things, Yeah, you know, but that's that partnership. That's that partnership at every level, whether it's research and design, whether it's your research questions. Um, I think we can ask so much better research questions. You know, the autistic community consistently identifies mental health needs. Yeah. And speech doesn't have mental health practitioners, you know, they don't really have a strong background in mental health. We have a strong background in mental health. You know, how are we meeting those needs as well as the, all the other needs that we're doing, I think a really good job at recognizing. Yeah, I think that's, that's a really important topic. You know, when I was um, preparing, um, preparing to talk to you today, I was just really thinking about, um, you know, how, um, you know, me as a future practitioner can begin to um, you know, really truly understand the experiences of um, of the members of the disabled community. Um, and I think that's, you know, I think you really touched on that. Um, I, think I would add one thing though to you, Isaiah, for mm -hmm. your, all the students, start following disability activists on Twitter, on Instagram, and you'll see, you'll begin to see that this, and, and, and also too from an intersectional lens, don't just follow disability activists that are, are white and cisgender, follow 
follow disability activists from all different um, areas, and you'll 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 quickly see they're telling a very different story than I'm learning about no T school or I'm reading about, and and you will. And it, it's a good way I say to follow people on social media um, that are disability activists, um, only because it comes to you when you don't have to do anything, right? Except scroll, and then read. So you don't have to go to the library to look for something, you know, so it's a good way to begin to saturate yourself and get into the to the to the narratives that are really important for us to hear um, as professionals that are hopefully supporting. In this yeah, story. I think that, that's a that's a great way, you know, I um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for that advice. You know, it's something that um, should be shared and um, should really be you know, implemented by you know, students and practitioners to be able to you know, really, yeah, understand. I mean, that that's the most important thing is, you know, their experiences. How are you, you know, um, you, you really have to take in their, their full experience. If you're not experiencing, you know, how can you work with work with them, help help them achieve, you know, what they can achieve and what they want to achieve. So I think- And bring great. them onto campus, bring disability mm -hmm. justice activists onto campus um, and and um, and spon have multiple department sponsor, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, I think, a really good um, space to be in right now. Yeah. Well, Christy, thank you for chatting with us today. Um, we like on our, our little show here to um, end with a party game. And so um, I hope that you will be a willing participant as somebody who is a, how long have you lived in New York City now? Uh, since 2007, so okay. 15 years. So as a New York City transplant, we want to know, the, our game today is, are you a real New Yorker? <laughs> okay. So we ha I have five questions for this you. This is the most nervous I've been all lecture. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. So Isaiah's going to keep score. There's five questions. If you get three right, you win our, our prize, which is uh, Isaiah's voice on your home answering machine. I'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, 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 tell me. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay. So first question, this should be an easy one. Name one well-known nickname for New York City. Uh, the Big Apple. All right. Um, and do you know why it's called the Big Apple? This is a follow-up bonus question. Do I know why it's called the Big Apple? Actually, that's a good question. I don't think I do know why it's called the Apparently, apple. I had to look this up. I know why it's called the city that never sleeps because it never sleeps. <laughs> yeah, if you sleeps. live if you live three blocks from NYU, then you probably do know why it never sleeps. No, this was the Big Apple was referred to prizes that were awarded at horse racing events in the 1920s. I did not know that. Yeah. So they had horse races, and they would give them apples. I, I think that's it. Honestly, <laughs> that we're assuming Google's correct. <laughs> <laughs> if it's on the internet, it must if be right. It must be true. All right, second question. Name three professional sports teams in New York. One of them has to be a women's team. Okay. Um, I'm going to say, well, the Knicks, the Yankees, and what's the WNBA team? I can name a lot. <laughs> what's the uh, Liberty? Yep. Yes, the New York Liberty. You got it. I would have also accepted uh, New York, New Jersey has Gotham FC. Women. Uh, okay, okay. And two for two. Two for two. You're doing great. All right. The first pizzeria opened in New York in 1905, and it's still around. What is the name of the pizzeria? Joe's or John's? Um, or is the one in Brooklyn? Oh, it might be the one in Brooklyn. This pizza war. to Spring Street. If you know. Oh, um, it's in, so it's in, yes, it's in Little Italy. What is it called? Mm. I, John's Pizza. Lombardi's. Oh, oh, Lombardi's, of course, it's Lombardi's. Oh, gosh, I get a demerit on my New Yorker call there. There you go. Oh. All right, you have time to redeem yourself. What New York City spot is the most film location in the world? Most filmed location. Times Square, Central Park would be my guess. Um, Times Square. Central Park, you were so close. 
530 plus movie credits. So oh, do I get half a credit for saying? half a credit? I'll go <laughs> half a credit. All right. This is this is the last one. I had never heard of this. What is the New York pizza principle? The New York. These are not easy New Yorker <laughs> questions, Stacey. Um, the New Yorker pizza principle. Uh, all cents. New Yorkers would know this one. You got to pay 99 cents a slice. I don't know. It is. It argues that the cost of a sub subway ride and the slice of a slice of pizza should remain relatively equal. So if a slice of pizza or if a subway ticket is 275, a slice of pizza should be 275. Mm, that I did not know. I, I just know that 99 cent slices are very popular because <laughs> they're below the cost of the subway. OK, well, that's still pretty close then. <laughs> I think we're going to give it to you. I got it. I got it. It was about cost. It was about. It was cost. about cost. I'm going to give it to you. Yeah. All right. I'll, I'll, still, I'll still do the half. voicemail. What's that? <laughs> I'll, yeah, I'll, please. I'll, I'll still, still do your voicemail. Thank yeah. you, Isaiah. Thank you. <laughs> but you do have to go to Lombardi's for lunch. I have been to Lombardi's. I can't believe I didn't get that. I was thinking, you know, I'm in the village, and we have John's and Joe's Pizza. Those are the two battling pizzas that have been here forever. And uh, so, yeah, Lombardi's. I should have gotten that when you said Spring Street. That's all right. I love New York. I I uh so come I think visit. go to Lombardi's the next time I'm in. Yes, come visit. Come visit. You know, I'm at the point in my life. David Sedaris talked about middle age, and one of the joys of middle age is that we get excited about having a guest bedroom. So I now have a guest bedroom <laughs> in New York City. That's something to be said if you live in New York City too. Exactly. A guest bedroom. All kids moved out. Made it. <laughs> so. Well, Chrissy, thank you so much for being here with us today. Are there any last words of wisdom or any resources you want to point people to if they want to learn more about your work or just about the work of the disability community or the strengths-based approach that you've talked about? Yeah. Um, so I would say, you know, obviously the, the Twitter accounts of disability activists, I think, and the Instagram accounts are one of the best resources out there. Um, we have made all of our research open access. So um, we, along with my, my, my former doc student, my current doc students are publishing um, a lot around our maker project and they're all open access. And I think if you, as an OT, if you're interested in this and you wanna kind of learn a new body of knowledge, um, go study the double empathy problem. I think that's a really nice area for researchers and educators that are working in the field of autism because the double empathy problem um, that we're doing work on and that a lot of people have done work on, Damian Milton just did a op-ed editorial in the Autism Journal. Um, it's a great way to look at where the shift is happening and get yourself into a new body of knowledge that basically says, no, we've looked at it wrong. It's not about not autistic individuals not understanding non-autistics, whether that's robot faces, emotions, social, you name it, X. It's about there's this mutual reciprocity of a lack of understanding. And how can we then create interventions that really look at a cross neurotype understanding and facilitating that on both sides? You know, and I think if we did that, we would have less bullying. We would have, you know, so this double empathy problem for those clinicians that are out there that have been working in this space or educators or researchers, that I think is a really rich area for us to dive deeper in as, as OTs. I love it. <clears throat> All right. Well, thank you so much for being here with us today. We appreciate your time and your knowledge and just for putting all this work out there. So thank you. And we'll see you guys next time. All right. Thank you both. It was a pleasure. Take care. Bye. Take care. Bye.